Rosie the Riveter by Madeline Van Rissingham and Abby Thiesing. Rosie the Riveter is a national figure that represented women who worked during World War II while men were fighting in the war. Women's encounter with Rosie affected them by encouraging them to help during the war and to maintain their lives at home. These women helped by working in factories, shipyards, auxiliary services, and other occupations. This later led to women's rights, which is important to women because it gave us the rights that we deserve. For years, women were expected to stay at home with their children and do chores around the house. After years of oppression, some women wanted to change these expectations. In 1848, the Grisha Mott and Elizabeth Beatty Stanton organized a meeting to focus on women's rights. The first meeting was called the Medical Policy Meeting. This meeting helped women gain a greater amount of social, civil, and moral rights. They also discussed the roles women were to play in society. During this convention, they wrote the Declaration of Sediments. It was an important factor because it helped spread the news of women's rights movement across the country. The Seneca Falls Convention led to the first National Women's Rights Convention. This convention was held every year from 1850 to 1860, except for 1857. The first meeting had over 1,000 participants, but more would have attended if there had been more space. In 1869, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton formed the National Women's Suffrage Association. Not everyone accepted this association. Some people thought it was unrefined. But Stanton and Anthony did not give up. On February 26, 1869, Congress passed the 15th Amendment. This amendment was the suffrage of African American men. Seeing African American men get suffrage encouraged women to fight harder for their rights. After years of working for these rights, in 1900 to 1904, Alice Paul, a suffragist, feminist, and women's rights activist, adopted what was called the Winning Plan. With energy and enthusiasm, the organization made their final push towards an amendment. During World War I, Carrie Chapman Catt, an American women's suffrage leader led an organization drive for full women's suffrage. So with the support of World War I and a persuaded President Woodrow Wilson, the 19th Amendment, women's suffrage, was added to the Constitution on August 26, 1920. This ended the 72-year struggle of women's suffrage. Twenty years after the 19th Amendment was passed, World War II began for the United States. Women could not hold jobs for a long period of time. If they did work, they only made half as much as men. Then in the 40s, women started taking jobs vacated by men. 65% of the U.S. aircraft industry were women. Some were even in the armed forces. While others worked as telephone operators, mechanics, engineers, tank drivers, air raid wardens, and nurses. The reason women took these jobs was because Rosie the River encouraged them to do so. In 1942, during World War II, a man named J. Howard Miller made a fictional character that was to be known as Rosie the Riveter. Miller created posters that were well known around the country. One of his most famous posters stated, We Can Do It. Although Miller created Rosie, it was actually Norman Rockwell that made her known as Rosie the Riveter. On May 29, 1943, Rockwell created an advertisement in the Saturday Evening Post. The reason she was called Rosie the Riveter was because of the song Red Evans and Jacob Lowe made as an advertisement called the Rosie the Riveter song. She's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, the riveter, keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage. Sitting up there on the fuselage, that little friend can do more than a male can do. Rosie, the riveter. Rosie's got Rosie the riveter is a national figure that signified women who worked during the war. When women encountered Rosie, they were encouraged to undertake jobs vacated by men. The reason women took on these positions was because Rosie showed them they were capable of doing the same as men. 
Rosie increased the number of women in the workforce from 12 million to 40 million, a 56% increase from 1940. The woman that modeled for Rosie the Riveter was Geraldine Hoff Doyle. Geraldine was a 17-year-old phone operator from West Arlington, Vermont. Rosie was not the only person that encouraged women to join the workforce with advertisements. The U.S. government also encouraged women to join the workforce with the help of advertising agencies including J. Walter Thompson, Office of War Information, and many others. OWI refused to increase wages in fear of inflation. Instead of raising wages, they focused on patriotism and emotional appeal. They used posters, magazines, and radios to advertise. These advertisements had two aspects, the positive approach and the negative warning. The positive was do your part, and the negative was a soldier may die if you don't do your part. The more women at work, the sooner we'll win, was the campaign slogan. It promised women that their contributions could bring their men home earlier. In the beginning of the war, only single women who aged 20 to 30 years old could work. But by mid-1943, about 90% of single women and about 80% of married women were working in factories. Most positions that women held were mechanics, engineers, tank drivers, ship builders, factory workers, air raid wardens, fire engine drivers, ambulance drivers, and women's royal voluntary service volunteers and nurses. 640,000 women were in the armed forces, 55,000 served with guns and provided air defense, and 80,000 were in the land army while others flew unarmed aircraft. Rosie helped women to get involved with the war by giving them the determination to work and to help succeed in the war. Rosie also played as a role model by showing women they are strong enough to work and take care of their daily lives. We think that the impact Rosie made on the U.S. was substantial to women's rights and to where women are now. After the war was over, women were still urged to keep working. The welfare state created jobs for women such as the National Health Service for Nurses, Midwives, Cleaners, and Religious Staff. But these jobs paid lower wages. All jobs were separated by gender and were categorized as women's work. It wasn't until 1963 that it was required for an equal amount of work you would receive an equal amount of pay. The Civil Rights Act in 1964 prohibited judgment against women in any company with at least 25 employees. Presidential order in 1967 banned bias against women who were hired by federal government contractors. Later, around 1980, about 17% of doctors, 2% of lawyers, and 7.5% of engineers were women. After gaining rights to work, women felt they should be allowed to join sports and educational activities. This is where Title IX came into play. Title IX addressed the discrimination between men and women undertaking educational and sporting events. After a long fight, they gained the right to be active in these events. Rosie the Riveter was, and still is, a national figure that represented women who worked during World War II. Women's encounter with Rosie affected them by encouraging them to help during the war and to maintain their lives at home. These women helped by working in factories, shipyards, auxiliary services, and other occupations. This later led up to women's rights, which is important to women because it gave us the rights that we deserve. We are thankful that Rosie was encountered, otherwise we may not have the rights we have today. All the day long, where the rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie. The Riveter keeps a sharp lookout for sabotage, sitting up there on the fuselage. That little friend can do more than a man can do, Rosie. The Riveter, 